Hi, everybody. Welcome to this latest session of Art Talks, my mini Art Talks. It's been a long time. I've been really, really busy. It is March 30th, 2021. And no better time to have a new mini art talk than in order to celebrate spring. It's been a long, very, very, very long, cold, hard winter, and we may finally be seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And that's why I want to say that I hope everybody is able to get their vaccinations and that they will follow all the protocols and do what needs to be done so that we can get back to some semblance of normal as soon as we can. So in order to celebrate this, I thought it was a great time to take a look at depictions of spring from throughout art history. So the first one I'm gonna start with is Sandro Botticelli's Primavera. And this is from 1482 and it's at the Uffizi Gallery. This is of course, one of the most recognizable paintings in Western art. And it's showing us this group of figures from classical mythology and they're in this lush and beautiful garden. And this is an allegory and it's based on rebirth and fecundity and the lush growth of spring. And so we can see the progress of the season of spring starting from the right and going across the painting. And here on the right, this is Zephyrus. He is the abiding wind of March and he is he kidnaps the nymph Chloris. Seems like in these myth, myths, uh, one a woman is always getting abducted. So he's he um, uh, abducts Chloris, but he marries her, and then she becomes a goddess. She becomes the goddess of spring, Flora. And here is Flora. She's the eternal bearer of life, and she's scattering roses on the ground. And in the center, we have. Venus, and of course, she's the goddess of love and the embodiment of beauty, and she's also the goddess of April. And in the air above her is, is Cupid, and he's aiming his bow and arrow to the left. And then you have the three graces, and they're so happy that it's spring, and the flowers are blooming, and they're dancing around. And then on the uh, extreme left is Mercury, and he's clothed in red with his sword and helmet. And he is the god of the month of May. So he is chasing away the last clouds before uh, he can bring in the summer. So uh, this is just a wonderful depiction of uh, the whole progress of the season of the spring. And then we have Giuseppe Archimboldo's version of Spring from 1573. And this painting belongs to a four part cycle of the seasons, one of which is in um, the Louvre in Paris. And he is symbolizing spring, the sunlight and the air that brings new growth after the winter. And he paints the dress of this woman, right? You see here in this exuberant display of leaves, so what a wonderful salad. And then he paints her skin. It's a, a very pale field of flowers. And then her nose is this wonderful lily bud. And then look at her hair. It's just a riot of many different spring blossoms. So even though this painting was made more than 300 years ago, the flowers just seem as fresh and alive and vital as if we had picked them today. Now this is Jan van Heysem. It's a vase of flowers next to a column, and it's from 1717 to 1720. It's at the Kunstorisches Museum in Vienna. And he was an 18th century representative of that long tradition of Netherlandish floral still life painting. And you see the flowers, these gorgeous exuberant flowers, and it's also birds' eggs in a nest, and a fly, and there are butterflies and other uh, little insects around here. These are all metaphors for ephemera. What he's trying to tell us is that just like these earthly symbols of spring, we better live a good life because just like these symbols, we will eventually experience winter as well. Now, this is a, um, a little work by an anonymous artist from India. It's called Maharaja Gaj Singh with court ladies playing holy. And it's from about 1750 and it's at the Pennsylvania, Muse uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art. 
and it's done with black and red ink on kind of opaque watercolor over traces of charcoal. And it's, he's showing us these, these people that are very playful and colorful. It's just like the day it celebrates. And that's the, the um, a celebration of Holi, which is the festival of color in India. And it's also a festival of spring and a triumph of good over evil. And what happens in, during Holi is people gather in the streets and they joyously throw all of this powdered pigment of all these different colors at each other uh, into the air. And it just creates this beautiful, wonderful uh, springtime uh, mood. Now let's go to Japan. And this is um, uh, Kisai Essen, Beauties and Spring Wind. And it's a woodblock print. It's from about 1828. I think it's so beautiful, this uh, series of three. And you see these wonderful women and they're kind of being battered by a, a, a pretty strong spring breeze and the wonderful cherry blossoms there. And I love the fact that each is wearing a different um, uh, outfit and they're each so, so beautifully uh, rendered. Now this is a Claude Monet. This is springtime from 1872. It's at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore. And he's showing this, us this beautiful young woman and she's sitting in this glade in the springtime. It's air still has a little bit of a nip to it. You can see she's wearing her, her a little long sleeve jacket here, but she's so happy reading, so content. Look at her face. And then the light is coming through the trees. The foliage has bloomed and blossomed. And uh, you have all of this dappled light on her dress and on the ground. It's just the perfect, the epitome of a wonderful impressionist painting. Now this is by Walter Crane and he um, is giving us the story of per Persephone. It's actually called The Fate of Persephone. It's from 1877, it's in a private collection. This is another story from mythology. And here you have Hades of course, the god of the underworld, and he spies Persephone, and she's out picking flowers one day with her maidservants, and he falls in love with her. And of course, when you fall in love with someone in Greek myth, you have to abduct them, which is what he does. He uh, takes her uh, to live with him uh, in the, in the uh, underworld, and her uh, maidservants are horrified, and they witness the whole thing, but they can do nothing about it because they're separated from her by this crack in the earth. Now her mother, Demeter, is the goddess of the harvest and she uh, presides over grains and agriculture and the fertility of the earth. And she is so bereft that her daughter has uh, gone to the underworld that she travels all through the world to, to find her. And doing this, she is just in the depths of despair. She completely neglects uh, allowing anything on earth to grow. And finally, Zeus, who's being besieged by people on earth and other deities that he's got to do something about this or everybody is going to die. He tells Hades, all right, look, you're going to have to return Persephone to her mother so she can start the cycle of, of uh, growth again. Well, he realizes, Hades realizes he has to abide by this request, but he first tricks Persephone into eating some pomegranate seeds. And this is food of the underworld. And Crane puts a pomegranate tree here in the painting to, to symbolize this. Now, a pomegranate, because it is the food of the underworld, now that she's eaten it, she has to come back to the underworld at least for part of the year. So this is the explanation for why we have spring, because during the winter when she's with Hades, nothing will grow. And then when she comes back to be with her mother, then you have uh, the abundance of all of the agriculture that Demeter um, uh, is able to control. So this is, uh, this is uh, Crane's, uh, uh, Walter Crane's vision of this wonderful story of Persephone and uh, her abduction. Now, this is Vincent van Gogh, The Crow with Peach Trees in Blossom from 1889. It's at the Courtauld Institute in London. Now, this is his very last view of this plain outside of Arles. Uh, Vincent travels to Arles in the south of France in February, and it's, there's still snow on the ground. So he is actually there as the spring blossoms in the south of France. And that's the, the vision that, that he's uh, giving us now. 
And he went to the south of France because he thought that the light in the south of France was the most like the light uh, in Japan, and that he was always inspired by Japanese art. And you can see in the background here, look at how he has the snow-capped mountain, which is very reminiscent of the um, uh, of Mount Fuji that is included in many of, uh, of, of Japanese uh, prints. And then also here, though, he has a, a peasant, a human being working in the field, because this is Van Gogh saying, way of saying that man is an integral part of nature and that nature would not be the nature that we love if there wasn't man's intervention into nature. And I love, I love that, uh, that idea. Now, this is one of the most recognizable um, uh, images from art uh, from Van Gogh and it's uh, almond blossoms from 1890. And it's in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. And this was uh, painted uh, by um, <clears throat> Van Gogh right around the time that he leaves Arles, I believe. And he paints it because his brother Theo and sister-in-law Joe are going to have a baby and he paints it as a gift to the baby. And, she, and of course, uh, Theo and Joe do hang this um, above the baby's crib. And the baby is a boy, and he is named Vincent after uh, his uncle. Now, this is George Innes's Spring Blossoms, Montclair, New Jersey, from 1891, and it's at the Met. And um, this painting is very close to my heart because I live right near Montclair, New Jersey, and I've been to the Montclair Art Museum many, many times. And although this painting is not there, many Innes's are there. And Innes um, began his career painting actually uh, Hudson River School mode, um, uh, but then he embraced a variety of different styles. And then by his, his later period, he produces these landscapes like this that are just full of, of uh, increasingly expressive and atmospheric feelings. And you can really see this is spring and you're in this wonderful orchard and you can almost smell the, the blossoms. Uh, it's such a, a beautiful, beautiful work. Now this is by Lawrence Alma Tadema. It's called Spring and it's from 1894 and it's the J at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. And he's uh, showing us this procession of women and children and they're descending the, these marble stairs and they carry and wear brightly colored flowers. And you have all of these cheering spectators that are watching this procession. And they're all standing uh, amid the, in this classical architecture. And, and this is uh, um, Alma Tadema trying to link his art to the classical uh, era. And what he's doing is representing a custom of his day, of the Victorian era, with um, uh, when, when children went out into the country to gather flowers on May 1st, which was May Day. But he puts the scene in a classical setting because he wants to, to evoke that feeling. And it is said that Cecil B. DeMille, that he was inspired by this very painting when he made the film uh, Cleopatra. Now let's look, focus in on here. Here are some of the, the soldiers guarding um, the children as they uh, bring their flowers back to the town. and. Here's another close up of it. You can see the beautiful flowers and the wonderfully colored uh, outfits that they're wearing and just evoke uh, the happiness and joy um, that you have in spring. And then here is um, back to Japan. This is Yoshu at Chikanobu, Cherry Blossom Viewing from 1894. And it's another triptych of woodblocks. And again, take a look, here is Mount Fuji back there. So you can see why Van Gogh was, uh, uh, why he added it in his, in his work. Now, these are the ladies of the Imperial Palace at Chioda in, in Tokyo. And they leave the palace in order to see all of the wonderful cherry blossoms in bloom. And apparently this is a practice that is common throughout Japan and has been at least uh, since the eighth century. But this, uh, artist has given us just the most beautiful, serene, happy view of what it is to be alive in the spring. And speaking of being alive in the spring, into the 20th century now, we are brought there by Auguste Rodin. And this is his work, Eternal Spring from 1900. 
And I've always found Rodin's works to be so amazing because they're all, they're, they're either bronze or they're stone, they're permanent, they don't move, they, they can't go anywhere. Yet he gives us this air of weightlessness and a floating quality here. And the lovers here embracing, it's the perfect ode to springtime love. And Rodin created this when he um, was involved in a romantic relationship with for a long time actually with uh, Camille Claudel, who was a wonderful artist in her own right. And uh, he's expressing uh, their love. Um, and it also has to do with the fact she was also a lot younger than he was. So eternal spring, uh, you know, she made him feel, feel uh, very young. Now this is John Lafarge spring from 1910, 1912. And it's made of opalescent glass, painted glass and lead. And it's at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Now he was one of the first American artists to respond to Japanese art. He loved the, the flowing contours and the asymmetrical compositions and the color harmonies of the East. And he fused these elements in, with a real kind of Western artistic motif here. It's kind of reminiscent of a Renaissance painting. And he really invented modern opalescent glass. Now this is William, uh, John William Waterhouse, A Song of Springtime from 1913. This painting is in a private collection. And he was an English painter known for working first in a very academic style, but then for embracing the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood and the, their style and their subject matter, as you can see here. So you have a woman and she's kind of uh, in, the, in the fields gathering flowers with all these young children. Everything about this is about youth and, and, and uh, happiness and, and uh, what is possible for the future. And of course, as always happens when you're gathering flowers in the field, your blouse always comes undone and, you know, reveals your breasts. It's just, you know, I always hate it when that happens. Now, this is Daniel Garber, Buds and Blossoms from 1916. I had never heard of him before I uh, put together this talk. And it, this uh, painting is at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And he was an American Impressionist landscape painter. He was a member of the col art colony at New Hope, Pennsylvania. And he's best known today for his large Impressionist scenes of New Hope. And uh, most of them depict the Delaware River, as you can see, as it does in, in this work as well. And um, he also painted figurative works, interior works, and he was also a great etcher. And in addition to being uh, an artist himself, he also taught art at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts for over 40 years. This is such a, a glorious view of, of springtime on the Delaware. And I love the way he's made these blossoms because it almost, almost looks like they're snowflakes. They're just uh, uh, really so beautiful. Now this is one of my favorites in this array that I've, I've shown here. This is Joaquin Saroya, Gardens at the Saroya Family House. It's from about 1920 and it's at the Museo Saroya in Madrid. And I love this painting because I think it's so abstract. There is absolutely no, or almost no outline in this painting. All of the forms are rendered through the brush strokes, through his brush strokes and through the color that he uses. And the light, of course, the dappled light that's coming through all this could be very reminiscent of Impressionism, but I think it's, it's almost verging on the abstract, which, which uh, makes it very, very uh, modern. Now this is a Georgia O'Keeffe's Spring from 1923-24, and it's at the Art Institute of Chicago. Now Georgia and her husband, Alfred Stieglitz, um, they often treated the same subjects in their art. He was, he was a photographer. And in spring, in this painting, she paints the building that held his dark room up at Lake George and on his family property, they summered in Lake George every summer between 1919 and 1927. And that area in Lake George, really inspired um, some of her uh, uh, very, very interesting paintings of, of nature and of the natural world. But let me just, uh, this is Alfred's photograph of the same scene, uh, but he did it in the, the previous winter, the winter before. But, you know, she has uh, kept a lot of things and she's changed a lot of things. Um, she's simplified the building. She's kind of, she's gotten rid of this, the chimney here. And she's also gotten rid of the, um, uh, um, windows in the door, and she's gotten rid of the um, 
horizontal planks on the outside of the building. So the building really just becomes the series of geometric shapes. And we know Georgia O'Keeffe was very into color, very into shapes. And uh, she really is a, an abstract painter, if you really know a lot about her work. It's really rooted in abstraction. And look at what she does with this flagpole. She curves it at the top there. So it, it, she almost emphasizes its upward thrust there. It looks like we're looking uh, up on it. And she also replaces the background here, these mountains, she just replaces it with flowering trees of purples and greens. And then it, it kind of blends into the white of the, of the clouds as well. It's really su such a, a, a wonderful uh, painting. Uh, I think uh, very, very, very much. Now, um, this is the last image that I'm going to show you. This is by Hans Hoffman. It's called Spring 1940, and it's at MoMA. And obviously, it's a completely abstract work of art, but it still evokes the joyous abundance um, and happiness and motion and uh, uh, of springtime. And um, it's... Uh, he was such an interesting artist and he was also a wonderful teacher of artists. Most, many, many, many of the abstract expressionists took uh, art classes from him both in New York and at Provincetown and uh, also uh, revered him very much. So from Primavera in the 15th century all the way to Hans Hoffman in the 20th century, uh, I hope I've given you um, a look at springtime from the eyes of many different artists and you can see that spring gives us hope it nourishes our souls and can also bring us much, much pleasure and happiness. So please um, join me for my longer form art talks. You can find my schedule on my website and please subscribe to this YouTube channel if you haven't, I would really appreciate it. And I'll say goodbye now and hope very much that you will uh, uh, come and see me again at one of my next talks. So it was really delightful to spend these early um, uh, days of spring with you and look forward to uh, getting back to normal. Stay safe, everybody. Bye-bye.